Welcome to the MSDN Show. Today we've got a special treat for you. Recently, Eric and I went down to TechEd down in Orlando, Florida, and did some special filming for their web broadcast to a TechEd audience. Um, we had a lot of fun down there, got to talk to some people. That's right. We hosted several Q&A sessions, met all the different speakers. I even talked with Bill Gates and Bob Muglia. It was a lot of fun. We had some, some parties going on, some hot mm -hmm. weather a bit. Very hot, uh, very humid. Yeah. And we even had a chance to talk to some of the people out in the audience about uh, what mm -hmm. their thoughts are about the show and uh, sign some autographs, I suppose, and stuff yeah. like that. But, you know, that sort of stuff goes on. <laughs> yeah, it was lots of fun. Yeah. Now, uh, before we go into the rest of the show, I think probably doing a news broadcast is in order. Mm -hmm. Time for the news. Okay. Hello, I'm Erica Wickers. Welcome to the MSDN News Update. Microsoft recently demonstrated to an audience of 14,000 developers at TechEd a new developer tool that has been designed to provide a flowchart logic approach to developing BizTalk applications. This new tool, known as BizTalk Application Designer, is based on the recently acquired Visio technology and provides visual programming access to BizTalk orchestration. It is expected to ship later this summer as part of the BizTalk Server 2000 product. For more information about BizTalk Application Designer and BizTalk Orchestration, you can check out Microsoft's BizTalk website at www.microsoft.com slash BizTalk. At TechEd, Microsoft announced the immediate availability of the Digital Dashboard Resource Kit 2.0, which includes a new Internet standards-based approach for building components called Web Parts. Web Parts enables developers to structure the delivery of web-based content and services using a common XML schema, make an easy-to-manage and distribute digital dashboards throughout an organization with little or no programming. The Digital Dashboard Resource Kit 2.0 is free and currently available for download at www.microsoft.com slash solutions slash km slash digital dashboard .htm. Recently at Forum 2000, Microsoft unveiled its roadmap for the next generation Internet, signaling a new era of personal empowerment and opportunity for consumers, businesses, and software developers. This initiative, called Microsoft.net, will allow the creation of distributed web services that will integrate and collaborate with a range of complementary services. More information about Microsoft.net can be found at www.microsoft.com slash presspass slash topics slash F2K. On June 26th, Microsoft formally announced C Sharp, a new programming language that has been specifically designed to be simple, modern, object-oriented, and type-safe. C Sharp is derived from C and C++ and aims to combine the high productivity of Visual Basic with the raw power of C++. It will be included as part of Microsoft Visual Studio 7.0 and along with Visual Basic, Visual C++, VBScript, and JScript will provide access to the next generation Windows Services platform via a common execution engine and a rich system level class library. Developers can find out more information about C Sharp and its upcoming availability at msdn.microsoft.com slash vstudio slash nextgen. And that's been the MSDN News Update. I'm Erica Wickers. Welcome to our special segment of Enter the Programmer. Recently down at TechEd, Robert spoke with Kyle Marsh, and they talked about Win64 and what it means to developers. Kyle's been working with developers for quite some time now, helping them understand the specific issues involved in moving an application from being a 32-bit application to a 64-bit application. Hopefully, he has some good pointers to help you understand what it means to you in your development efforts. Let's go listen to what Kyle has to tell us. Now, Kyle, what, what do you do at Microsoft? Uh, I'm a uh, developer engineer working on the evangelism team uh, for the desktop uh, operating systems. And focusing right now on some Win64 issues? Um, one of the things I'm looking at is Win64. We also look at some other desktop things uh, that are coming up, but Win64 has been a lot of what I've been doing lately. But what does that exactly mean to the program? That Win I mean, we just got through having to switch from Win16 to Win32, it seems like, to me just almost yesterday. Uh, but now here we're talking about Win64 already. Right. Uh, well, the, uh, the, 
this, the 32 bit address space has become confining for a lot of applications. So it does mean for the programmer a lot of the similar kind of change uh, moving that we did from 16 to 32. Um, but actually, it's a little easier now because when we did the change from 16 to 32, we, we put a few steps in, in place, a few things in, in, in order uh, that make this transition a little bit simpler, a little bit easier to do. Um, when we did the 16 to 32 bit translation, we had a lot of APIs that had to be uh, tweaked and fiddled with and worked over. Uh, we don't have anywhere near that much this time around. Uh, and therefore, you can move right into the 64-bit uh, the address space, have a lot of memory address space available, uh, as well as a lot of uh, the power of the 64-bit processor uh, at your disposal. Now, I remember in, in, in talking to people about the switch from 16 to 32 and talking about the API and that sort of stuff, uh, there were like many, many, many cases where um, there was a lot of work the programmers have to do just to get their applications running on Win32. Um, does Win64 still present that sort of barrier so they're going to have to really take a look at the program? Or is it more from the standpoint of taking advantage of Win64 that they need to take and make these changes? A lot of it's taking advantage. Um, th there's a couple caveats there. The, the big thing is um, what we call clean code. Um, the first step in getting your application running as a 64-bit Windows process is you need to go through and, and recompile it with a 64-bit compiler. Uh, in order to uh, make that possible today, we actually ship uh, the first pass of the 64-bit compiler in the Windows 2000 SDK today. So anyone who has a, an SDK has the first pass of the 64-bit compiler. Uh, it plug-in uh, replacement for the 16 or the 32-bit compiler we have today. So you can just put it in a directory and have Visual Studio work with it or your current build process. Uh, what it will do is spit out a number of warnings that do highlight areas that need to be changed. Now, if you've written your software to be very clean, so for example, if you compile under warning level 4 today, there won't be any changes you need to make. Uh, in all likelihood, your code will already be clean enough to run a 64-bit. If you're not using a high warning level or you're using something like warning level 3, uh, you need to use the new compiler just to get a, an idea of a better uh, warning messages that we've tailored for the 64-bit environment. Um, we've already got the pound defines necessary uh, the, uh, the data types necessary for 64-bit. Uh, if I step back and look at what the 64-bit API set really is, what we call Win64, as opposed to the old Win32 API set, um, officially or technically, it's fairly different. Uh, let's look at send message, for example. Send message now returns a 64-bit value, and three of its four parameters have become 64-bit. So technically, it's a fairly different API. But if I write out the declaration for send message, it still returns an L result, takes an HWIN, a message, and a W param and an L param. Well, those W param and L param data types have been tailored for the right operating system. So on a 32-bit uh, target operating system, they're a 32-bit entity. And on a 64-bit, they're 64-bit entities. So as long as you're passing uh, an L param type value as the fourth parameter, or what you pass is, so if you have a pointer at the 64-bit pointer, it needs to be cast to something. If you cast it, as you currently do, to pass the warning levels to L param, everything's fine. You need to make no changes to your code. Unfortunately, a lot of developers, instead of using the proper data type like LParam, tend to cast it to a D word or a long, which was never really right, but it was okay because it got, you got through it. Since the, the data model is slightly different on 64-bit, um, one, one of the big things we did was we were using something called an LLP uh, data model, LLP64 data model. What that means is we're leaving ints and longs as 32-bit values. Uh, this is so that uh, Portability between 64 and, and 32 bit uh, is much enhanced. We want everyone to develop their software using a single set of source code. That's how we're developing the operating system. So we have one set of source code, we build a 64 bit version, we build a 32 bit version from the same code. We don't have a lot of pound defines, it's fairly clean. We don't want to make it very difficult to have that process in place. So in order to do that, we've left the, the ints and longs as 32 bit. Pointers, of course, become full 64-bit entities. Obviously, in order to address the address space, you need a full 64-bit pointer. So we use the entire address space there. Um, so therefore, some of the things like the LParam or handles need to move to 64-bit as well. Uh, if you use the data types as they're laid out in the Windows header files, things like LParam, LResult as the return value from send message, you'll be fine on running 64-bit. A lot of applications or a lot of developers have used D-words, uh, have used the use of longs and, and switched them around. So you need to have the compiler, take a pass through the code, and having done that, uh, the chances of your application then just running as a 64-bit application are very high. 
Um, I've taken a few samples from the SDK, for example, and after cleaning them, where, you know, lots of places where the fourth parameter of send message is a D word, um, then they do start running as a 64 process, and they're up and running fairly quickly. You know, another issue in, in doing that, even just, you know, casting the values to an L param value, um, if the developer in preparing that message code had a value that was not intended to be a 64-bit value, but they are actually assuming it was a 32-bit value and they're simply casting Dell Aren't they still going to have a problem with that? Well, it depends what kind of what kind of value you're thinking of as uh, assuming a 32-bit value. Um, there are there are cases where you want to continue to to leave it as a 32-bit, right? But normally, yeah, you know, there, there's sometimes where I'd write code and I would do a send message to myself and I'd have it, you know, a little proprietary message I'd be using, and I was just simply wanting a value that told me customer ID or something like that, and I would just kind of pack it into an LPRAM and pass it to myself in that fashion. Most of the time that's going to work, right? Because what, what you're, you've got some variable, right? Uh, that thing you're going to pack uh, that eventually you'll pass as an LPRAM. So you're declaring an int or a long maybe or, or something, right? Um, you'll have to, that'll be packed into that, that data will be put into that variable. You'll put that variable as the fourth parameter and cast it currently to a long, and the, or you would, should have cast it rather to an LPRAM. Um, if it was a long, a lot of times people wouldn't have done any casting; would have just got away with it. But if you were compiling at warning level four, or even even in the code you had, you cast that variable to LPRAM. Um, the fact that that gets moved into a 64-bit entity, the fact that you have 32 bits moving into 64 bits, you're never going to lose anything there. We have plenty of headroom to take what you've already done and put it into one of the bigger data structures. Mm -hmm. uh, the more of the problem we have is in code is. Uh, one example is uh, uh, list box items, for example. Lots of applications manage things in list boxes. Well, you ask the list box for an index, and because you're going to use it for some, maybe you're indexing something else, uh, some other data structure on the disk or something based off that index. Uh, send message returns a 64-bit value. So in theory, we're, we're giving you an index that could have 64-bit worth of items in that list box. Now, None of my list boxes have quite that. Well, yeah, it's probably not that. a really good user interface to have more than, oh, a few million items in a list box, right, let alone a few billion items in a list box, right? So in that case, we actually, uh, adv I'm advising people to not necessarily take that, uh, that index, which is probably currently an integer, and make it a 64-bit integer because I'm really probably never going to have more than a couple of billion items in a list box. And by moving everything to 64-bit, like absolutely every data item, you know, oh, I'll just make everything 64-bit and it's simpler, I'm just causing my code to bloat for no really good reason. I'm not going to have more than 2 billion items in a list box without changing that user interface. Uh, therefore, we w I would in that case cast the return from the send message back down to 32-bit. There's lots of places where people might be doing that. However, say you're getting a handle back. If you try to cast that into a 32-bit item, that's a real problem. You have to go and clean that code. So someone who's taking uh, a return from a send message and casting it to an int instead of you know, a handle, casting it to a handle would, be, would have been fine. But if you cast it, you know, a lot of times programmers seem to like to, to kind of think that they're a little brighter than the compiler sometimes. Oh, I'm not going to use ints and longs. I, I prefer D word. It's much more explicit. Okay, fine. Now D word's not good enough. D word's not big enough to hold a pointer. So, casting the fourth parameter to, L per, uh, to send message, or taking the return from that send message and casting and saying, "Oh, this is a D word," that's problematic code area. If you had said, "I cast it to a handle because that's what I'm putting it into," this is an L param, you're much better shape. The it's code is smart. clean enough to run. Yeah. Now, another aspect of, of of taking all of your data values and upping them up to 64-bit. Uh, would come with um, streaming your, your, your data blobs into a file. Let's say you're trying to maintain a word processor and you basically just took your structures, streamed a into blob into a file. Well, all of a sudden, that file structure is incompatible with your previous versions. Exactly. So uh, by the fact that we've gone with LLP64, you're, you don't normally try to store pointers or handles of things that have to be 64-bit elements uh, on, on disk structures. There, there'd be no point in say, saving pointers. Right? You're just wasting space. But a lot, you save a lot of words and ints and longs. Uh, uh, structures. So those items stay as 32-bit. So we keep the compatibility between the but, but stuff you're writing on disk since we've picked that data model kind of explicitly to help um, compatibility as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it's a good, it's, it, it's one of the main reasons we picked that model uh, to help the, the, the application developer move his code so he can have a 64-bit version and a 32-bit version very quickly and just be running a, from the same source of code. Mm -hmm. And then therefore your communications 
uh, on disk the same way. We've also made it so that, for example, uh, if you use COM today as an inter-process communication technique, we make that work between 32-bit processes running on the same system and 64-bit. So we make that work. We make our RPC interface work between 32 and 64. Now, if you're doing something other than COM or other than our RPC in order to process, uh, communicate with another process, and you decide to not make that process 64-bit, but in you know, you, as you go forward, you may not decide to do everything 64-bit right away. You may say, well, I'm going to make this 64-bit, but this application or this other process will stay at 32-bit. You have to be careful about interprocess communication across that 32-bit, 64-bit boundary. Uh, we make it just work for common RPC. But if you're using something else or something a little more homegrown, you need to be cautious about that. So are we providing a thunking mechanism to get across that barrier? We are not going to allow, uh, well, we, we supply the common R RPC to do the, the translation or the, the move between the two processes. Uh, we don't allow the mixing of, a, of an address space in a single process. So if you have a 64-bit application, all of its components must be 64-bit. The DLLs in, in, in PROC COM, they must be 64-bit. Uh, another process can run on the system as a 32-bit process uh, using what we call the, the WOW layer, the Windows on Windows 64 layer, which allows 32-bit processes to run on a 64-bit processor and 64-bit Windows. So we, we'll handle the, the, it's not so much a thunking, but we'll handle the translation between those in our, in our published methods. But you're not wanting application A to, to get a pointer to a function in application B and then call that function directly? No, we're not. We're not we're not, we don't, that won't work. Okay. Could you take and use like send message to send in a message and pass the parameters and wait for messages to come back? Yes, through the windowing system. That the same, in the same way that that works today on our Windows on Windows, we, we currently have a WOW layer, Windows on Windows, that runs 16-bit applications in the 32-bit address space of, of Windows 2000. Uh, and, and, and the ability to run and, and say exchange messages or hand, hand this to Windows, that was still working. We can still do that on the 64-bit process. Um, so we, we support that in the same way as we did before. Um, but we, you can't pass a function pointer and, and have it make any sense at all on the other. It's like callbacks just aren't going to. Right. So we make calm work. We do the, the, the marshalling between any place where we can marshal, we can handle it for you. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's not going to go. So it sounds like you know, the best attitude then is, is to try, can try to embed COM as deeply as possible within your application. So you're exposing COM interfaces, and that way you don't need to worry about it quite as much? Yeah, you don't need to worry, but we'll do a lot to make it work. Another um, hint there is if you make most of your stuff out of PROC, right, uh, your COM components so that they could run out, then you have a choice of deciding whether it has to be 64 or 32, uh, and you can stair-step your schedule somewhat. Mm -hmm. If it has to be an improc thing, then you must make it 64-bit right now in order to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can make decisions about stair-stepping your development a little that way, too. Now, why, why exactly would a programmer want to be thinking about moving to Win64? It's headroom. It's all about head Well, there's, actually, there's two things. There's the headroom of the address space. And, and you know, we can do a lot of things because we've, you know, we can bring a lot of stuff into memory. Uh, you can cache a lot of things. Um, you know, 64 bits uh, data addresses is, is enormous. Uh, right now, we're going to, in the initial implementation of, of 64 bit edition, uh, we're going to have just under 8 terabytes as the user addressable uh, memory space. So you can do a lot if you had 8 terabytes of memory to, to work in as far as caching things. Now, the other thing is just as a 64 bit process, you can take advantage of a very sophisticated processor. The 64-bit processor is not a Pentium widened to, 30, to 64 bits. It's a whole new architecture. And a compiler that understands this new architecture can take advantage of a whole raft of new optimizations that this processor enables. Uh, things like predication and speculation. Um, these are very sophisticated techniques in order to move us to a whole new generation of, of performance uh, on the processor. Um, right now, uh, you know, the Pentium, for the most part, does things in a fairly sequential manner. Uh, the Itanium can do things, many the, more things the, at a the time. The Itanium? Sorry, the, the, the Intel's 64-bit processor is, is uh, going to be marketed under the name Itanium. And it will be done uh, out sometime before the end of the year. Uh, and, and it's 64-bit Windows at the moment runs on an Itanium processor. And these 64-bit processors are very sophisticated devices. They allow a lot of sophisticated optimizations to, to really start moving the performance window much higher. So an Itanium is not just a Pentium with bigger address spaces? No, not at all. It's a completely new um, instruction, pro uh, instruction set. It's, it has a compatibility mode to run the old 32-bit processors on the chip, 
but it's a whole new ball game. At least, so that means the operating system vendors and the compiler vendors are doing stuff all new because we're dealing with a much lower level, a whole new process, a whole new um, instruction set that we're dealing with. And they're probably getting bored of that old stuff anyway, weren't they? That's right. They, 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 they needed something else to do. At, at the most application level, who are programming to the Windows uh, APIs, it's not all new. It's a cleaning up process. It's making it run as far as these, at the first pass of getting your process up and running in 64-bit. Once there, you might make some other decisions. For example, I used to work on a large accounting package, uh, and it was always preferable to do uh, store the dollar values as pennies so that there was no decimal point. So it's just an integer. Therefore, it stores easier and it, it's more accurate and it's a lot faster. Right? The problem is it only goes to about $400 billion using an unsigned do, a value to do that. Therefore, it's not really big enough for a really big company to deal with. You know, it's just, that's not enough money. Not, certainly not enough yen. Right? So you need bigger values. Well, now I can convert those accounting packages back to using integers because I've got a lot more headspace as far as a lot more yen, drachmas, dollars, whatever, can store in that 64-bit in integer. So even it's not necessarily, oh, it's a big database. Sure, big databases are going to use the memory, cache a lot of stuff. But even something as off the beaten track as, hey, accounting packages could benefit by having 64-bit integers. Right? Therefore, they're doing it as integer math. Therefore, it's much faster. So if I'm doing a depreciation of a large corporation's you know, asset, uh, set, and I'm doing the tax calculations to do it, you know, we can significantly cut the time down to run those calculations by doing them on a 64-bit processor. Mm -hmm. So let's say then you're a programmer and you decide, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bite the bullet, I'm going to go to Win64. Um, what do they do today? What do they do today? Um, the first thing you should do uh, that everyone can do and is accessible to everyone is get the compiler out of the platform SDK. Right, it's available on MSDN. You can, you, you know, everywhere that the platform SDK is available. There's a Win64 directory on there uh, inside the bin directory, and in there is the first pass of our compiler of, of the Microsoft 64-bit compiler. Okay, and what's that, what's that file called? Um, uh, it, one, of the, one of the things that always bothers me sometimes is people, oh, you just take and install the new DLL and everything works fine. Okay. It's like, okay, you don't know what the name of the DLL is, you don't know what the tool is supposed to use to install it with, and and you don't know how to tell whether or not you installed it right in the first place. Okay, so install the platform SDK. And in there will be a bin directory inside of that Win64. In there is basically CL.exe and C1.exe, the, the core components of, a, of the Microsoft compiler. Uh, those are things that are called by Visual Studio. Okay? So then the next step is either you can, if you just want to see where you are, you could replace your current copy of C1 with this to see what happens. Or you could point Visual Studio to use this other directory instead of its current directory. So you map that path in prior right. to the prior path to of the bin directory. Right. So. Or, or if you're using a make file or another process, you can just map that path of where these are so that you get the new error messages out. Those, um, we especially have, have implemented something called WP64, uh, dash, big do, capital W, P64 for 64-bit pointers, uh, warnings, and we enable a special group of about a dozen or so warnings that are the typical problems we see in applications as they move from 32-bit into 64-bit. So you map in this new compiler, set the warning level to WP64, and then see how co clean your code is. And setting that warning level is something you need to do manually in the command um, line Actually, setting. there's one other thing. Uh, the one other way of using the compiler, inside of the platform SDK, there's a setwin64 batch file which just sets up all of your um, environment variables to point to the 64-bit compiler. If you're using, say, a, a batch make file, or, or even if you've exported the make file from a Visual Studio project, you can, then you can run it from a command line. You can call that. Uh, inside of that environment, there's a W64-bit uh, make file that, that sets this switch. But if you've got your own environment, you should set the WP64 um, yourself manually, as opposed to W3 or W4, whatever you're using today. Because like right now, like in Visual Studio, you bring that up and you got all you know check boxes and stuff like that. It's not going to show. WC. It's not going to show WP64. So right. if you're inside of Visual Studio, I think the easiest way for the one I prefer to use in Visual Studio is to simply do an external make file. Um, Visual Studio will let you export a make file, go in and and, and set the WP64 switch in that, and then running that from a, do a command prompt, having called the setwin64 batch file ahead of it, I'm now producing 64-bit code instead of 32-bit code. And from inside of the environment, I continue to build 32-bit uh, code. So if I make a change, I check, make sure it's still running on 32-bit, I haven't broken something inadvertently, I continue to build both at the same time. And I just put a tool inside of the tools menu using the tools customize, I drop a little command that says run the batch file to 
to, to run the build. Okay, so that way you're not accidentally switching to 64-bit mode, and then you go back the next day and you start to compile, and you accidentally did a 64, and you meant 32. Right. That way I, I keep them separate, and I, and, I, and I generate the two projects at once. Yeah. Now, once they've done that, then, I mean, do they end up with an executable that's, that can run on the Itanium, then? Not at the moment, right? Not from what they get from the platform SDK. If you're at, past that point, the next step is to actually try to get a hold of a, an Itanium-based processor in order to run um, your application. Uh, unfortunately, I think this is not just buying a chip and replacing your... With it's your not buying a chip and it's not going to the store. Um, you're going to need to make a relationship with Intel, uh, who has the Itanium processor today, in order to obtain an Itanium. Um, it's just not available. So, But if you were to present yourself to Intel and to Microsoft saying, but I'm ready, I'm sure something could be worked out. Mm -hmm. um, There's information on our website that helps people understand this process a little bit better of, of creating that relationship with Intel? And, um, or do we... Not have that out there yet. Not we don't have that out there yet. We although we do have an alias uh, DRG Win64 at Microsoft.com, uh, and that alias, if you are at the point where you're saying, "Hey, I, I'm ready. I, I've done this clean code, and I'm, I really I've got a product that's going to benefit. I want to get on it." If you were to mail that alias DRG Win64 at Microsoft.com, we would be able to get things going. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a couple of other ways uh, for some of the smaller ISVs or ISVs who who having asked Intel and unable to obtain one, we, we are operating a, a, a way of, of making Itaniums available over the Internet um, so that you can have a, a place to test and run your code. Uh, when you have access to an Itanium... And making it available over the Internet doesn't mean like going to Amazon.com and buying it. No, no, Itanium. I'm actually using an Itanium over the wire. Using the terminal server as part of Windows 2000, right? Uh, the 64-bit version of Windows 2000 is still Windows 2000, therefore terminal server runs on that platform as well. So you can use Terminal Server to, to, to dial up one of our Itaniums over the Internet. And remotely and, access it. And remotely it. access the machine over the wire. Uh, use a, once you're at that stage, we can give you the rest of the compiler. We can give you debuggers you can use over the Internet as well. And now you have an environment to, to build and test with. If you can get an Itanium on your own, we can still supply that as part of the, the beta operating system and the pre-release of the pre-beta of the operating system that includes the tools, the full compiler, a debugger, in order to actually develop software. Mm -hmm. um, most of that work still happens on your current Pentium, right? So we compile on the Pentium, with the debugger runs on the Pentium. Over the wire, it remotely debugs the Itanium. So most of it, I know your tools still live on the, the, the Pentium you have today. It's still enlisted in, 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 in your same source code com project, project. You don't have to have a whole new raft of tools. You just need the new compiler, plug it in place, do the work. When you're ready to, to run and test, and you get a hold of an Itanium that you can access either directly on your site or one of ours over, over the Internet so that you can uh, test and debug the code. Mm -hmm. Now, from a timing standpoint, I mean, uh, if I was a company developing stuff, I'd be you know, more intense about getting a Win64 development environment if I knew that a couple months from now these things would be in common use. What, what is the time frame <coughs> you're talking about here for Win64 to be actually out there in people's hands? Well, we expect Intel will release the Itanium processor toward the end of the year. Uh, we'll have a version of 64-bit Windows available for that processor, uh, and we'll have a, a, a pretty solid release uh, at least soon thereafter. So toward the end of the year, the, we expect them to become generally available. Mm -hmm. um, and we will have the tools and the, the, the operating system you need in place whenever Intel is ready to, to ship that processor. We expect it toward the end of the year mm -hmm. sometime. So let's you know, look back at your financial program you said you were writing. Let's say you were back in the end of the lifetime and you were working this financial program. Um, how soon would you be maybe expecting some of your customers to be coming at you and saying, when are you going to have 164 release because I've now got a machine to use on it? Are we, are we maybe thinking you know, early next year or something? It would be, yeah. Uh, you know, the, it, it's, it, it's, we're launching a whole new platform here, yeah. right? So there, there are certain chicken and the egg kind of problems that need to be sorted out. Um, uh, developers are, uh, need to write software so that someone can buy a machine that, that is used running the software on. Uh, your, you know, Itanium machines are, are, we don't know what the pricing is. Obviously, that's going to be in Intel's realm. We expect them to be reasonable, but they're not going to be a, you know, a $500 PC you go down to, to the local store and buy. These are serious pieces of hardware. They're going to be relatively expensive. Yeah. Um, you're going to want software that exploits it. So, to, frankly, at the beginning, we see a lot of software developers buying them to get ready and getting 64-bit software. 
Um, so it'll probably be next year before some of the software starts to show. Now, at least as far as the, the, the desktop environment. On the server environment, there's a lot of uh, big server companies who are chomping at the bit to get into the, get their stuff going on 64-bit world. So we expect that there's a lot more interest at this point in getting those servers. You know, people like the SQL servers of the world, um, the big database uh, people, the big the big internet servers are wanting to exploit this hardware right away. So you might see them a little bit quicker in the server environment. Um, but we also have a, a lot of interest from the high-end graphics, high-end uh, CAD CAM kind of applications, where they can obviously benefit from from the, the higher headspace they have today. Um, so it sounds in that, that for some developers out there, uh, it's, you know, right now is when they need to start thinking about getting with support for other people, they can maybe wait for a little while? Uh, I think developers should at least be thinking about doing the clean code now. Right, the ability to take it out of the platform SDK and start, you know, even if for no other reason, get a sense of how much work am I going to have to do to get my code clean. And then it can be something that can be worked into your current development schedule as, you know, as you're doing more work or doing uh, maintenance work, you know, we should start thinking that, hey, I'm going to, everybody needs to do a pass on this to make sure I can clean up the code so we spread this work out a little bit. I think that's something a developer should, all developers should really be about thinking about doing right now. From there, they can make a decision of when do I actually have to jump in and either buy itaniums or find a place to, to, to borrow one from, and you know where is my market and how fast will that market move. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the big bulk of the work, which is getting all your code clean, I think that's something people should start thinking about and, and scheduling into their process right now. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Kyle. Uh, okay. Enjoyed the information you had to give us. Uh, Win64, it sounds like it's getting ready to knock our doors down here, and uh, it's time to get busy on it. It's very soon. Okay. Very soon. Thanks, okay, Kyle. Thanks. Welcome to our special segment of Diversionary Tactics. You're about to see a video, a little behind the scenes look at TechEd 2000 and how 14,000 developers attended sessions and basically had a lot of fun. Proof positive that even geeks can have fun with the right motivation. This is true. Welcome to our special segment of Techno Babble. Also down at TechEd, Robert spoke with Stan Morosky, and they delved more into the architectural aspects of Win64. Now, Stan goes by Stosh to his friends, and so uh, down at TechEd, when I talked with Stosh, uh, we talked about the architectural aspects and how that involves in thinking about the development of your application uh, in the early phases, getting ready for the new Win64 platform that will be coming out pretty soon. So. Let's go hear what Stosh has to say about getting your applications ready for Win64. Welcome, Stan. Hi, Robert. How's it going? It's great to be here. Now, what do you do at Microsoft? I am also an evangelist, as was Kyle, and I evangelize Windows to the developer community, uh, specifically within the high-end enterprise data center oriented community and more server oriented but not exclusively. Okay, so data center and server that sounds like the sort of thing that Kyle was saying is exactly who we're going to go after Win64 for. Oh yes, 64-bit Windows, the Itanium processor is all about what Kyle called headroom. Uh, it's up to the next level in scale. It's more transactions, it's more users, it's larger databases, it's larger objects now thinking more in the workstation. It's more. It's the progression we've made from 4-bit processors to 816 uh, and now to 64. It's the next step in our evolution of our technology base. So in talking about the, the architecture of, of what Win64 brings to the table here, um, what do people really need to understand from that standpoint? Well, I, I think I'll tell a story about a trade show uh, where I did a demonstration jointly along with Intel. And on one side of the table uh, were some Intel guys who, of course, are hardware-oriented guys. And they had a titanium computer with its guts open on the table. And what you could see there, what you could talk about there, is it's a whole new ballgame. It's not x86 anymore. It's not... Uh, so even just looking the at the motherboards and stuff like that, you could tell it was not a... Well, you get that feeling from the nature of the machine. Because mm -hmm. the whole thing is high-end. The whole thing's about high capacity. The whole thing's about lots of memory. So there are many slots in there to put memory chips, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's a new ballgame. That's the point. It, it's a new architecture. It's a new instruction set. But from the Windows perspective, from the user's perspective, from the um, Win32, Win64 developer's perspective, it's not a new ballgame. It's Windows. It's Windows 2000. It looks like Windows 2000. It runs like Windows 2000. And in fact, if you've got that clean code Kyle was talking about, 
your code just compiles and works, as do some of the samples in the SDK. Hmm. So you get the advantage. You get the speed. You get the scalability. You get the big address space. You get the big numbers. And you, you get it easily. And, and that's the whole uh, foundation of a lot of our design decisions about the, the LP64 that Kyle mentioned, to have maximum compatibility so the existing code can move forward and get that scale advantage with a minimum investment. So if, if the end user is not going to see any difference on his desktop running Windows, per se. He's still, he's still running Windows. He doesn't know whether it's Win32 or Win64. I suppose if we had you know, updated Win16 to look the same as Windows does, they'd, they'd think it's Win16 as well. Um, doesn't that create a slight barrier for the application developers to create more of a thought of, I've now got a better application running on this system? Better is going to come two ways. And the main way better is going to come is speed. Itanium is about scale. So if we're talking about end user, we're talking about workstation, we're talking about something you see right there firsthand, uh, it's speed. You know, believe it or not, as a, from a consumer perspective, there's a lot of applications at the high end. For example, solid modeling simulations or, or maybe engineers at, at, at an automobile manufacturer that are doing vibration analysis, trying to decide about suspension bushing thickness. Those guys are out of capacity. The two megabyte address space isn't big enough. Or the processor time is such that the simulations take hours and hours to run. Well, if you can take a four-hour simulation and change it into a two-hour or one-hour simulation, so you can afford to do twice as many or three times as many before you make your design decision, that's a huge advantage. So it's interesting. It's not necessarily that the same people are now one day running Win32, the next day running Win64, but it's almost like people that weren't previously able to run Windows for this problem, maybe they ran Windows on their desktop due to the word processing and spreadsheets, but they went to the floor of their equipment manufacturing company, they had to switch to some other system to get that stuff. They can now be running Windows in both those scenarios, one's a 32-bit version and one's a 64-bit? Well, certainly that's true, although I don't, I don't, I have to bring it back to time. I have to bring it back to time. There are, uh, software systems for things like these simulations we're talking about that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in licensing fees. The engineers actually schedule slots of time to use the simulator on the computer it's on, whether it's so currently with or cards not. Again, like I used to do in college and, and schedule time and got PSI well, it's, it, The schedule time is the same and the limited availability is the same and sometimes you need to come in at night is the same. If those slots become two hour slots instead of four hour slots, twice as many people can get in, or you can get in during the day, or you can get twice as many shots, so you can do a better job. Mm -hmm. And so maybe then you're not even seeing necessarily the, the interface, you're just submitting a job to a system across the internet, perhaps? And so well, you're never physically, visually touching or seeing the computer. The computer but is running Windows, it's running Windows code, because the developers writing that code are so familiar with the platform that they're able to make that great application code running on Win64. Yes, and now you're talking more like a server scenario. Right. Uh, and, and the server could be deployed in this, this large batch job kind of mode where we're running a large simulation that takes many hours. Or you know, we can use these machines in the dot-com world. We can put up larger databases that support more concurrent users and a higher transaction rate uh, for the kind of volume demand that's out there uh, in web-based Internet applications. For example, the Windows DNA scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know one, one class of application that I heard about that was uh, seriously looking at Win64 um, as something that was important to them, but the kind of caught me by surprise was the games market. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my, my thoughts on that are that um, it's ironic that the gamers are the guys that have the highest hardware demand and the guys that are buying the most expensive machines uh, out there for the desktop. You know, server side, the dot-com guys are buying big, fast machines and maxing them out. But in, in the home desktop scenario, it's the gamers that have the high demand, both the graphics and video demand, and now the memory for the size of really simulations they're running with these multiplayer, worldwide, internet-based games. Um, so yeah, I think they'll get there. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen with the first set of boxes that ship at the end mm -hmm. of this year, uh, but they will get there. But, I mean, it's kind of interesting. You have almost on two opposite ends of the spectrums. You have your you know, high-end business usage, and then you also have your, your in-the-home entertainment stuff. In the middle of that is like your, your word processing, your, your databases, your modem communications, your browsers, and so forth like that. Um, 
are they being left out of this Win64 jump uh, from a, a need standpoint, or are there things that they actually can use on Win64 as well? And you see Win64 coming into the home in that fashion. Well, I think that's why we have the Win32 simulation uh, or the Win32 support uh, with WoW 64 on 64-bit Windows. Now, there are apps that run at, let's call it, keyboard speed. Uh, they don't need the advantage or, or really get any advantage from going faster. They're, they're fast enough, and they're, for some people, support apps, so they've got to run well on 64-bit Windows. You know, this engineer at the auto company is also doing email, so he's going to flip over to his email client, and he's also writing reports. So he's going to flip to his word processor. So they've got to be there. They've got to run correctly. Uh, but they don't need more scale. So 32-bit versions of those apps uh, need to get QA'd and tested and validated. And they're good. Mm -hmm. Here's, of course, until you add all those super fancy special effects to your word processing so the letters dance around on the screen and start acting like a game or something like that. And I'm sure some people out there probably want in their word processing. I don't well, know. I think those guys can get by with a 1 gigahertz pick okay. name. Okay. <laughs> Um, what, what do you view as the most important things for, for an application architect designer out there that's, that's thinking about the next version of their application or the current version of their application? Um, what do they need to focus on to get their team involved in Win64 development? Well, what's the advantage of 64-bit Windows? What's the advantage of 64-bit computing? At the lowest level, it comes down to large integers instead of a four billion as a maximum amount I can count in a single integer, which at the hardware level means in a single register, I can now count to 4 billion billion. So it's a much, much bigger number. So if I have an app that's counting many, many, many things, that happens in a single register now, so it can happen very rapidly compared to the kind of algorithms you have to devise if you have to count in two registers, one of which counts how many times the other one filled up. So statistical kinds of processes, uh, particularly in a scientific scenario where, you know, atom disintegrations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the other one is pointers, large pointers. So the integers go to 64 bits, the pointers go to 64. What that large pointer means is I've now got a memory space that instead of being two gigabytes to the application program is 8,184 gigabytes. So let's imagine video editing which is an application that even is coming in to the home. If I'm editing a, a large movie, Star Wars, I'm editing Star Wars, and I've only got a two gigabyte address space like you have on a Pentium computer, I have to map that movie into memory in f small chunks of just a few minutes. And my program and its design has to think about which piece of the movie is in memory, which piece of the movie is in disk, and God forbid the user is going to want to edit across the boundary between two of these pieces. Then well, it gets very like complex. the old memory mapping we had back on the 8086 days with Lamb and Lamb and all that sort of stuff. Right. And it's a hassle of doing things piecemeal when the natural way to do it is to look at the whole movie as a single stream of data. Well, with 64-bit Windows, I have this 8,184 gigabytes to work with. I can map the whole video. I can use the file mapping APIs, map the whole video into memory and have much more simple programming model now for how I deal with this. It's just one nice linear stream of bytes, stream of data, stream of movie. Mm -hmm. Editing becomes simpler. The code becomes simpler. So in addition to more speed, there's fewer bugs. And the application developer can take and, and focus more on, on developing an application that edits movie rather than trying to develop an application that edits movie and has to manage memory in this weird way of making it appear like it's one big stream when it's really multiple streams. Right. More of what's in that application now is video editing. Right. And less of it is manipulation of lower level entities because of limitations uh, in the state of the art of computing, really. Mm -hmm. So from an architecture standpoint, it basically simplifies things. Yes. So the architect can now think about yes. their problems that they're really trying to solve and how the problems are being imposed upon them by the, the architecture of the platform. That's a very good way of putting it, Robert, mm -hmm. that, I, that I can now have a new simplicity approach to the design of my programs because I've got more capacity in the operating system and the hardware below it. Mm -hmm. What have been some of the challenges for the Windows development team themselves in developing Win64 on top of Win30, no, Win, taking the Win32 code base and moving it to uh, Win64? Because to a certain extent, isn't that the same sort of problems that uh, other you know, application developers are going to run into? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, truth is that some of our own programmers inside Microsoft made some of the same short-sighted choices that are uh, in code all over the world and seen even in some of our samples in the SDK. And Kyle's example, I think, was really excellent about using long as a typecast for a parameter in a send message. I remember years ago telling programmers, well, let's go back a step further. In 16-bit world, everybody used Word, and that meant 16 bits. And when we ported it all to 32, we said, well, it's all long now. It's all 32 now, so we cast it to long. And I remember being on programmers saying, don't say long. There's say L param. And the programmers would say, well, what's the difference? They're both 32 bits. Well, that was short-sighted thinking. They were both 32 bits in Win32, and they're not today. Mm -hmm. So if somebody did program with that thinking forward mode, they put L param in that cast, it just compiles clean. Some of the samples in the SDK just compile and run. And so that's most of the issue. It's mostly a mechanical issue of dealing with short-sighted choices made in the old code. Mm -hmm. I remember um, in the days of getting people moved on to uh, Windows NT early on, uh, first off, we'd help them you know, port their application from Win16 to Win32. And during that process, they would discover a lot of things that they were able to fix in their code to make their code, even on the Win16 model, they're still maintaining better. And then also when we had the multiple platforms, we had you know the, the Deck Alpha and the MIPS machines, and people moved mm -hmm. across into those platforms. Every time they ported their application to one of those other platforms, they learned more and more about little inconsistencies that they actually had in their code, fixed those up, and made all the other versions more stable. So in taking a Win32 application, porting it to Win64, seeing where they made these improper assumptions, do you think that might possibly also solidify the Win32 code base for them as well? I believe that if you take your code and you use the new polymorphic data types that are in the new headers that are in the SDK that Kyle referred polymorphic to. Polymorphic data types. I don't think we've mentioned those yet. A data type which, when you compile it with a 32-bit compiler, compiles to a 32-bit entity. And when you compile it with a 64-bit compiler, compiles to a 64-bit entity. So the so code stays the same on both platforms. Right. So I think the mantra, the, 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 the sound bite for Kyle's uh, discussion would be no source fork. One single set of sources, you compile it with a 32-bit compiler, boom, you've got Win32 code that runs on Windows 2000 on Pentium. You compile it with the other compiler, you've got Win64 code that runs now on Windows 64-bit Windows 2000 on Itanium. And if you get your code to that point of point of cleanliness. It doesn't sound like good English. <laughs> Get clean code that compiles both ways. It's going to be better code because you're going to have thought through more fully the issues about going both ways and, and what your data is really doing, what your code's really doing. And so uh, an LPRAM is one of these polymorphic types. Right. So an LPRAM does not by itself define a size. It defines more of a concept of what you're trying to get to, and it does the right thing on the different platforms, whereas Word and DWORD conceptually define their size. Uh, by the size of the computer itself. Exactly. And there are uh, these polymorphic types that have the names of the entities they're working with, like L param is dealing with a long parameter, uh, that are derived, in fact, from pointers. And pointers are the core or, or foundational element that goes 32 or 64. Now, what if you wanted to take and work with a pointer? Um, how would you take and define a pointer? Um, so that you really understood what was going. Did you just say pointer and it just becomes 64? In, in fact, a set of the new types that are in the new header file uh, end with underscore pointer. It said D word underscore pointer says I have a pointer now that points to a D word. But the point, it's the size of a pointer for whichever platform I compiled for. Mm -hmm. So you can keep it straight. And what if you needed to take and deal with the case where you've got a, you want to do like pointer arithmetic? And <laughs> <laughs> pointer arithmetic. Okay. We're talking about clean code here. <laughs> I always have fun with pointer arithmetic. Oh, the the worst the worst um, sin. I'll go that far. Uh, in some of the code that we've looked at, is where programmers used the top bit in a 32-bit address. They knew that out of the 32 bits, since the bottom two gigabytes belongs to the user and the top two gigabytes to the operating system. That top bit's never used, so I can use it for a flag. And that's not a good thing? Well, when you go to 64 bits, that 30, bit 31, that 32nd bit, well, that's just one more bit in the stream of bits. So you're going to get uh, bitten by that bug. Okay, so <clears throat> point arithmetic is out then, huh? 
Well, it's actually not out anymore in 64-bit than it was in 32. It it's just been always been a, now. let's call it a dangerous thing to do. Okay. Okay. And it's Proceed at your own risk. It's fun. Though. Um, what other things do you think uh, architects should be, you know, concerned about? Okay, one thing is concerned about: no more point arithmetic. Just get rid of all that stuff and fire all the programmers that are doing it. Um, and making sure your application is polymorphic enabled so that it can compile cleanly. Now, are you also wanting to get rid of ifdefs to separate 64-bit code from 32-bit code? You probably don't need any in your code. Uh, that, if, if you do it, if you do it right, uh, one of the fundamentals to get to the point you're making is to cast to data types that are representative of the entity you're working with. Don't say long, don't say word, don't say something specifically 64. Say L param because it's a long parameter. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to uh, compile right, and that'll work, uh, you know, and someday in the future we'll probably be talking 128 bits, right? Or maybe it'll jump to 256. It'll still work because it is a long parameter, and that does the right thing for the system uh, you're compiling for. Um, I lost my point. You're talking about if-defs? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the new header file, the name of that header file is base tsd.h. That's in the platform SDK that defines all the new types, and it's automatically included by the new windows.h that's in this generation of the SDK. Uh, all the ifdefs are there to deal with the platform dependency of, of whether you're compiling 32 or compiling 64. So that's where all the types are being defined, and that'll depend on what's going on. Exactly. So the occurrence of needing to put an ifdef in your own code is going to be zero to low. So you should probably look for those, look for any if def 164s in your code or where you need to do that and see that as a potential problem that you might want to try addressing in a different fashion. You're probably thinking about the 1632 transition and the number of times you had to say if def win 32. I had to do that a lot. Else win 16. And that's because there was vastly more difference between win 16 and win 32 than there is to win 64. Uh, in fact, I almost don't like using the term Win64 because it implies that there's a new API with substantial change, and there isn't. It's the same API set. We don't, you know, there are not changes of the order of arguments. There are not changes like in Win16 to 32 where the data stored in LPRAM and, and uh, WPRAM had to be swapped because the sizes of things changed and didn't fit anymore. It's, it's much simpler change than that. So it's called really Win32 left shift one then, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it really comes down to the, to the fact that pointers and items derived from pointers, such as handles, are 64 bits wide. And that's it. It's, it's not a new API. Not a new API. So that's your mantra. It's not a new API. Right. Kyle's mantra is, is never code fork. Never use a code fork. Right. right. No source fork. No, no source fork. Uh, and, and, and if you get to this Win64 set of code with no if defs in it, it'll build both ways. Okay. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm sure our audience appreciates, you know, understanding you know, a little bit more about the architecture of Win64. Uh, Kyle told us a little bit about the availability of Win64. It's coming soon uh, in a certain time frames, depending upon what sort of application you're developing. Uh, more information, I'm assuming, will be exposed off of msdnboxshop.com as well as uh, standard www.microsoft.com. Oh, I'd like to mention that there are good things now on the Microsoft website. At www.microsoft.com slash Windows 2000, if from there you search on 64-bit, you will get about 10 hits with 64-bit information that's directed at management, uh, IT managers, uh, etc. Uh, and on MSDN, if you search on Win64, you will get many hits that give you the same information that's in the SDK. And one of the files that's there and one of the files that's in the SDK I want to mention that Kyle didn't the starting point file, readme64.txt. That's in the SDK. Yes, and also MSDN Online, which gives you the description of those details you and Kyle went through about how to set up your compile, how to set up your environment, and take advantage of what's there today. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Dan. And as you work with more developers out there in the world and get more white papers and, and technology backgrounders and development samples and stuff like that on the web, um, I'm sure our audience will enjoy taking a look at them through msdnmarksup.com and we'll make all the information available, and um, your name will be on most of them, right? Okay. That's the plan. Okay. Thanks, Dan. See ya. Okay. To continue the tech ed theme for the somebodyatmarksup.com, we're going to talk with Dave Washa. Now, he did a demo for Bill Gates' keynote at TechEd, which is a pretty stressful thing to do.
After the demo, we then talked to them a little bit about the technology he was demoing. So take a look at some of this footage about that we did at TechEd, and then afterwards we'll come back and talk with Dave and find out a little bit more about him. So check this out. Welcome, David. Hi. <clears throat> it all begins in the, in the visual design environment. This is where the business analyst and IT professional meets the developer. On the left-hand side of the screen is where the business analyst or the IT professional would use these elements to describe our business process. And then on the right-hand side of the screen is where the software developer would connect that business process up to the components and applications and web services that do the work. I want to build a quick two-step process here. And what I want to do is get an order off of a, a queue from a customer. And I want to use a telephony component I built using Visual Basic to give them an automated phone call and let them know that we received their order. So what I've done is I've dragged some action elements out here. And we will connect them together. And let's call our first action get PO. Oh, spell it correctly. Didn't spell it correctly. Uh, let's call our second action, call the customer. And there we have it. We've designed our business process. This is the first step in using orchestration to build business processes. The second step is connecting this process up to the software components that do the work. Now, I know that my orders come in off of a message queue. So I'm going to drag the message queue adapter onto the screen. And I'm going to indicate which queue we want to get our messages off of. And then we simply need to connect the queue to our get PO action. And we've completed the first step. Now, the second step, after I get the purchase order, I actually want to extract the customer's phone number out of that and use it and pass it to this VB telephony component that's going to call the customer and confirm that we've received their order. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag the component adapter onto the screen. And I need to indicate which component it is that I actually want to use. And then I need to indicate which method on that component that I want to call when we get to this step in the process. Once we've done that, let's bring that over here so everyone can see it. Once we've done that, we simply need to connect our second action to the component, and we've completed the process. Now, what have we done here? We've designed our business process, and we've used the adapters for the MSMQ and for COM components to connect the business process up to the things that are doing the work. So if we go ahead and we'll validate this to make sure we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's, make sure we've done everything correctly. Now let's go ahead and save this. And what we're actually doing is compiling this business process into XML. And let's take a look at what that XML looks like. So what we've done, and as you can see, there's a lot of code here. And luckily, we don't need to write any of this ourselves. The business process designer does this for us. What we've done is we've designed a process. We've connected it to the components that do the work. And we've compiled it into an application. This XML code is the code that will be executed at runtime by the BizTalk orchestration engine. So now that we've compiled it, I want to go ahead and run this process. I've written a simple VB script that's going to run it. We'll go ahead and run it. And if it all works correctly, I should be getting a phone call on my, my cell phone here in a few seconds, letting me know that they have, in fact, received the order that we've taken off of the queue and handed to the visual basic component. So we go ahead and answer that. This is a message from Worldwide Suppliers to inform you that order 1040 has been received and will be shipped within three working days. Great. So we know that our component works. What I saw on stage that was actually kind of exciting. I mean, I was seeing a flow chart, like just my college days, and I was taking all these flow chart classes and saying, when the heck am I ever going to use this stuff again? And 
Actually, I never really have. Um, I mean, it is exciting, and sometimes when I show people that demo, they're not really that impressed because they don't understand what we're doing. I mean, we're literally changing the back-end business process of a complex system by drawing a picture. And so once you get that point across, people start to say, wow, oh my gosh, I can't believe that we can actually do this. Uh, we spent a lot of time building this technology, and it is, it is the coolest stuff. I mean, I'm as excited about this technology as I've been about any technology we've worked on at Microsoft. Now, for the most part, you just you draw a flow chart and then just connect up code that def defines the processes. It, I mean, it is a new concept, and it's a new way of building applications that people are going to have to get educated on. Um, this notion of separating the business process from the, the components, the applications, the web services that do the work is a new concept. I mean, today, like I said in the, in the demo, the business process is mixed in with all the code that you use to write the method calls and the database functions. And that, I mean, it makes it difficult to build a process and make it really difficult to change a process. Um, if you want to upgrade an application or add a new component, you have to go jumping into all of your code in order to make that change. So it only makes sense to separate the two out. And that's what we've done, essentially, is enable people and developers to do that with the BizTalk orchestration technology. Now, do you see this as possibly changing the, the way that uh, developers and corporations think about the architecture of their application overall? Good point, yeah. Um, it really is going to bring the business analyst or the IT professional, the person that has historically drawn the diagrams, together directly in a single visual design environment with the people that are writing the components that actually implement what the business process diagram wants them to implement. Um, so I think it's going to help those people to work more closely. Um, and as, as far as, as changing the architecture, we're going to be able to think about process without having to think about the limitations of software and vice versa. Now, um, I noticed the tool you're using was, was based on the Visio code yes. base. Mm -hmm. um, how well does it tie into other development platforms? Well, um, what we were actually emitting uh, is an XML syntax. I mean, that XML syntax is going to be open, and, and we're going to allow other tools vendors to go in and, and emit that XML syntax to, for consumption by the BizTalk orchestration engine. So to say, any tool that developers used to using right now for their website development or back-end code, methods, properties, events, for com components, stuff like that, they can now connect up this via the BizTalk uh, XML language right. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Now, could you imagine a company that's, that's not doing web-like stuff? Let's say you were um, a corporation that had some internal processing of forms and so right. forth like that. Does this also work in that fashion, or does it need to be an e-commerce sort of solution? That's a great question. And uh, it's one thing that I didn't really hit on in the demo. Um, BizTalk orchestration is for orchestrating any business process. And that means behind the firewall as well as going over the firewall. So a good example would be customer relationship management. There, you know, No CRM vendor has the best of breed piece of software for every piece of your CRM solution. So what CRM stands for? Oh, I'm sorry, customer relationship management, okay, right. Okay. Um, and so what people what our customers are doing is they're going out and buying pieces from each of these customer relationship management vendors. And they need to string them all together. And this would be an ideal technology to do that. And all that happens behind the firewall. So that's what went on at TechEd. Now, we've got Dave here with us, so let's spend some time chatting with him to find out more about not only what he demoed, but also a bit more about Dave himself. Now, so Dave, I know one of the questions after watching the demo and, and hearing about the technology is, like, where can they find out more information about it? Well, you can find all the information on the BizTalk product on www.microsoft.com slash BizTalk. Okay. It's a place to go for all the information. Now, what, what was it like doing a demo? in Bill Gates' keynote? Well, I don't know what was more nerve-wracking, doing a demo in front of 14,000 people or doing a demo in front of Bill Gates. <laughs> um, but uh, we were really well rehearsed. Um, we spent a good deal of time the, several days before making sure that everything went perfectly. Um, and obviously, we, you know, we have all the AV guys backstage making th sure everything is going smoothly. Um, and I got to meet Bill the night before and go over the demo with him, and that was interesting. Um, and, uh, it, and it went really well. I think we were w well prepared and it went well. So it was pretty exciting but nerve-wracking at the same time. So would you say that's your most stressful moment at your career at Microsoft or have there been others? 
That was definitely one of the most stressful. I mean, even when everything is really well prepared and you've gone through it a hundred times and you, you know, do it pacing backstage, you're still not sure, you know, there's always that tense moment when is the demo going to work or not? Because mm -hmm. everyone's seen the, when the demos crash and it's how sure. you're right there on stage with Bill Gates and, you know, you don't want to be remembered as the person whose demo crashed <laughs> a decade. Right. Um, Wouldn't be good. So, yeah, I mean, it, as far as a single moment of stress, yes, that was probably the most stressful moment. But it was also the most exciting, but yeah. afterwards it was exhilarating to, to be done. And, and, uh, so, so the what then is your best memory of TechEd? That was, I mean, meeting Bill the night before and discussing the demo with him. I'd never met him before. It was the first time I met him. Um, discussing the demo with him, he was really excited about it. He's excited about the technology. Um, and so that was very, you know, reassuring and exciting that the, the chairman is excited about the technology that you're working on. Um, and going through the rehearsal and working on how we were going to portray the product. Um, and then actually getting up the next day and walking out on the stage and looking out at the sea of 14,000 people was, was also amazing. So those are some great memories. So besides doing demos for Bill Gates, what else do you do day to day at Microsoft? Well, when I'm not speaking in front of 14,000 people, <laughs> uh, I'm actually a product manager for BizTalk Server. Mm -hmm. And what that means is I'm the, the public facing person for the product. Um, I do things like I work with press, I work with analysts, I work with customers to find out what they need in a product, and then I work with the development team to make sure that the customer demands and the customer requirements are then added back into the next version of the product. So, and I spend a lot of my time trying to come up with the best way to explain how the product, what problems it solves and how it can solve the various problems and challenges that people are facing today. So. Now that the tech has been over for a couple of weeks, have you been getting a lot of uh, input back about the demo you did and some of the new, you know, the big stock, big stock orchestration server and the uh, application design tool? Well, yeah, we had, a, I mean, it was a huge announcement for, for the product and it really put the product in an entirely different category than it had been before. We got a really great reaction from the press and from customers. I've been inundated with email and requests to do the demo again and other talks. In fact, I'm going to be doing it in Europe next week again at the keynote tech uh, tech ed keynote in Amsterdam it's great you got a lot of practice after 14,000 people in Orlando after 14 anything less than 14,000 <laughs> I can barely get out of bed to go do <laughs> not worth my yeah, time yeah it's not <laughs> so besides work um, what do you do for fun well I work for fun that's what I, that's all I have time to do now we this is a very busy time in our product cycle so I haven't been able to get out much but I do have a dog who is my uh, my buddy, and he reminds me to go out and have fun. So I walk him every day. There's a nice dog park near Microsoft's campus that I take him to. Um, and last week I went to last weekend I went to a concert at a venue near Seattle to go see Bob Dylan. So that was pretty cool. Fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been at Microsoft, and what were your first jobs there? I've been at Microsoft about three years. Um, and the, one of the first things I was doing was this little known technology called XML. <laughs> um, and I remember, and in fact it was interesting to go and meet with the press and analysts again talking about BizTalk because they were the same people I was trying to explain, this is what XML is, back before it became a standard. Um, so I've really seen it come full circle from XML as this thing, this kind of mysterious thing that no one really knew about, to now it's this foundational layer that all of these applications and server products and companies are betting their their viability on. Because BizTalk is based on XML. Exactly. BizTalk is meant to solve the problems. I mean, XML is a good first step, but now everyone has a different way of using XML to define, like, a, for example, a purchase order. So BizTalk helps to solve that problem by turning what you think of as a purchase order maybe into what I would use as a purchase order. So it does the transformation. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, we appreciate the time you spent with us here chatting about uh, your demo, your personal life, or your, your dog We're anyway, there, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we look forward to talking again in the future. Great. Thanks. 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 Well, that's our show for today. We hope you enjoyed our first on-location episode of the MSDN show, where we talked about Win64 at TechEd. We had a lot of fun down there, didn't we, Robert? We did. There's a lot of exciting things going on, and there have been a lot of exciting announcements coming out of Microsoft, mm -hmm, with new sure platform have. technologies and development capabilities and stuff like that, like uh, C Sharp, mm -hmm, like you talked about in the news. Mm -hmm. And so uh, pay attention to future episodes of the MSDN show. We'll be bringing you information about some of these new advancements coming out of Microsoft. Until then, we'll see you on the web.